Classmate is mad I'm forcing her to eat ethnic food. Go eat a loaf of bread. This happened about a year ago now when I was in high school. My calculus class was very chill. About 20 kids who were all friendly with each other, a laid back but enthusiastic teacher, and a light enough workload that we could afford to goof off in class but still learn and do well. At some point in the year, I got really into cooking. It's my stress reliever. My family couldn't possibly eat the amount of food I was made, so I started bringing it into school and hosting Friday parties in my calc class, with my teacher's approval, of course. Now, I am Vietnamese, and I live in a predominantly white town. This is only important because it meant that most kids from town only ate American or European foods and weren't used to eating other ethnic foods. Last year, around Lunar New Year, I wanted to bring in some Vietnamese foods to celebrate. It is a very important time of year for my family. I ended up making a bunch of bandalan, a steamed layer cake, and a traditional Vietnamese dessert. Some of my friends from class found out I was going to bring in a traditional dish and brought in their own traditional dishes from their own cultures, whether they celebrated Lunar New Year or not. We had different Indian, Korean, Filipino, and Spanish desserts. It was great, and I was really excited that my friends wanted to celebrate with me. Apparently, this was an issue for one girl in my class. I would say bandalon is an acquired taste, so when not a lot of people ate it, I wasn't offended. I knew not everybody would like it. There was a lot of other food anyways. During our lunch period, one of my friends, who wasn't in our class but knew I brought food in, overheard a girl from my class complaining about the food while on the lunch line. Apparently, she was saying really negative things about how I forced everyone to eat weird Chinese foods. Later that day, I texted her just saying I heard she didn't like the food and wanted to know why. I don't really care when people don't like the food. I make it for myself and bring it in when I have extra anyways. But her calling it weird Chinese foods, when she knows I'm Vietnamese, didn't sit right with me. Well, she texted back that it was rude of me to bring in weird ethnic foods that nobody would have liked except for me, and said I should know better since most of the class was white. I told her that I bring in food to share because I feel like it, and that I don't have an obligation to cater to her tastes. If she has an issue with it, she literally does not have to eat it. And other people can bring in food too, so if she wanted to, she could bring in something more to her tastes. After that, she just told me that I shouldn't bring in ethnic and foreign foods and stick with American foods, because we're in America. Excuse me? Like? How much you want to bet if I brought in jambalaya, which originated in Louisiana, she would call it a weird foreign food. Fine. She only wants to eat American foods. Then she can eat American foods. The next week, I brought in a bunch of olibol, a Dutch donut, and started passing them out at the beginning of class. When I got to her desk, I pulled out a loaf of Wonder Bread and plopped it on her desk, saying, Sorry, but these are Dutch, too ethnic. Here you go, all American cuisine. Later, she texted me asking WTF my problem was, so I told her that almost every single food I brought in this year was ethnic and that it pissed me off. She only had an issue when it wasn't European. She's entitled to not liking Asian foods, but if you're going to complain about it being ethnic, then you better have that same attitude when the ethnic food is white. And especially don't call another person's culture weird. She didn't complain about the food again. Story 2 the $15,000 equipment is too expensive for your department to purchase. Why don't you just rent it for $48,000 a year? Back in the days when 33.6 kilobits per second modems were hot shit, I worked for the engineering department of a growing company. This company had started small. It was privately owned, and the VPs had all put in a portion of their own money to start the company. By this time in the story, they were finally making a respectable 30. 40 million a year in profits. But they still acted like a small company, penny pinching. Our engineering department was designing circuit boards with embedded computer systems, and to program these, instead of soldering the microcomputer to the board, we would solder on a microcontroller socket and then plug in an in circuit emulator that would pretend it was a microcontroller and allow the programmer to create the required program. This in circuit emulator, or ICE, was made by Hitachi. It plugged into a free PCI slot on your PC and had a ribbon cable that would attach to the specialized microcontroller die that plugged into the socket. It was a mess. It gave our tiny IT department headaches, and it cost $15,000. And it was an absolute necessity for most of our most popular product lines. And there was only one of them. And we were renting it. It cost $4,000 a month. The first month we had it, 
Our CTO and marketing VP planned our whole new product line around this family of microcontrollers. So at the end of the month, U.S. engineers ask management to buy this for us, since we would be using it for a while. The engineering VP saw the price tag and told us to just rent it. Surely we would be done with it soon. Engineers being practical, forgot about the objection and just put our noses to the wheel. The CTO and marketing made plans to keep us busy using this microcontroller line for a while. They pre-ordered a few million chips. After a year, the VP of finance asked about this recurring contract line item. They called the engineer who had originally started the contract. The engineer helpfully forwarded the approval from the engineering VP and his later email asking to buy it and the VP's reply where he demurred. By the end of the week, this toy was ours, along with a second one, since finance determined that product rollout was being affected by not enough access to the equipment. Hitachi just gave us the first one. Stop charging us and never ask for it back. We paid $15,000 for a second one. No one got fired or demoted. But at the next department meeting, the engineering VP tried to tell us that we didn't have enough money to upgrade our PCs. That one engineer spoke up, would $40,000 cover it? The company found the money. Story 3. A customer wanted her ice cream crunchy, so I made it crunchy. Briefly during the pandemic, I worked as a manager at a Ralph's, a NYC area ice cream chain. And one night I, as I'm helping out scooping, I hear a customer getting annoyed at the window and starting to get snippy with one of the young kids who was working the window, so I head over to smooth the situation as manager. The woman is mad because the hot fudge on her hot fudge sundae is hot and going to melt the ice cream. I explain to her that hot fudge is indeed served hot, but she insists so I make her a new sundae with magic shell topping instead and let her keep the hot fudge one. By the time I return with that, this customer is stirring her spoon through another cup of cream ice. Kind of like a sherbet, she ordered, obviously about to complain about it. The flavor she ordered was called Graham Crunch, and she proceeded to tell me that there wasn't any Graham Crunch in it. That she orders this flavor all the time, and she knows that I am intentionally stiffing her. I tell her that this is just how the flavor is, and I don't name or make the ice cream, but she isn't having it. She wants me to fix it. We've got some crushed graham cracker topping in the back, so as she is berating me, I just walk away from her and grab the entire container and come back to the window with it. At this point, we've got a line of people down the block because this lady has held us up, so there are lots of witnesses to what I was about to do. Without breaking eye contact with her as she continues to tell me that I'm wrong about the ice cream I scoop six days a week, I open the lid of the container and empty the entire thing over her cup of the offending ice cream. Graham crackers are everywhere. Her ice cream is now definitely crunchy. She loses her mind at this and starts yelling at me she knows the owner and will get me fired. I tell her, yeah, Steve is a nice guy, and she responds with, I've known Steve a long time, to which I respond, well, his name is John. Get out of here and don't bother my employees for free ice cream again. Now sufficiently embarrassed in front of the long line of customers, the lady leaves in a huff and indeed never returns. The next few customers left us $1.20 tips in the jar to make up for her. So the kids who worked for me left with quite a bit more in their pockets than they normally would and realized that their manager had their back. Story 4. Don't tell people you're leaving. Okay, I won't. About 10 years ago, during my first full-time job out of college, I had a boss who decided she hated me. I'm not completely sure why, but she would go out of her way to make my life miserable demoted me to an overnight shift but wouldn't give me a reason, changed my shift around on a whim without notice, once changed my schedule for the next day after I had left without telling me, then wrote me up when I didn't show up on time. Stuff like that. She was a monster. So I was looking for another job. Well, I found one, and I went in to give her my two weeks' notice. This happened to be in the middle of a mass exodus for the company, as I was the fifth person to quit over the course of about three. Four weeks. Morale was very low, and whenever anyone quit, she would buy pizza for everyone, instead of addressing why the place was so miserable and people were leaving. After I gave my two weeks, she said, Don't tell anyone you're leaving. So I said, Okay, and walked out of her office and announced to all my coworkers, Hey, guess what, everyone? You're all getting pizza. And they instantly knew what had happened. She was very unhappy, and I felt great. I served out the rest of my two weeks, and she never spoke to me again. Story 5. Your working hours are 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. To clarify a few things, this took place in Europe. I was a salaried employee, 40 HR slash week. 
I left that job about 10 months after the event took place. I didn't get into trouble, and nobody tried to fire me. My probation period was over, and we have employment laws regarding constructive dismissal, so I knew their hands were tied. About four years back, I started a new banking job. All was well. Just that the management was pretty strict with timekeeping, which was weird as we were back office. My experience was in a similar field at another bank, and we had flexible schedules and received time in lieu. But rules are rules, so I followed them. I learned my tasks and got to know the wider team. Anyway, about four months in, I started to realize my senior manager didn't like me. I'm pretty assertive as a person, and I do know how to stand up for myself. He hated it. I would speak up during the meetings, ask questions, give suggestions, and so on, while the team would stay quiet. The week everything went south, I was working overtime, which was obviously unpaid. On Thursday, I did nearly two hours of overtime. On Friday, I thought I'll leave a few minutes early as I was done for the week. My manager was off. I left ten minutes early. On Monday, I come to work, and I got called into a meeting straight away. There were three of us in the room, myself, my manager, and my senior manager. Our conversation went as follows. My manager. Mem. I heard you left work early on Friday. Me, I did. I left ten minutes early. Mem. Did you ask for permission to leave early? Me. It was 10 minutes. You know I did about 4 hours of overtime last week. Why are we having this conversation, senior manager, SM? Because you left early without asking for permission. As a senior, you should be setting an example for the rest of the team. Me. Is this a joke? SM. Your working hours are 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., not 9 a.m. to 5.50 p.m. You shouldn't leave early without asking for your manager or my permission first. Is that clear? Me. Got it. It's perfectly clear. I listened and started coming into the office at 9 a.m. and leaving at 6 p.m. on the dot. At first, they didn't realize what was happening, but the week after the meeting was the last week of the month, and let's say the last week of the month was intense, especially the final day. The reports had to be completed, signed off, and submitted before the month's end. We covered multiple jurisdictions and would deal with Southeast Asia in the morning and the Americas in the evening. Our team was expected to work overtime due to this. Here comes Friday, the last day of the month. Showtime. I'm at my desk at 9 a.m. sharp. Most of the team have already been at the office for at least an hour. I, of course, have a cup of coffee from the cafeteria because I was a bit early. My manager looks at me and raises his eyebrow, but he doesn't say anything. Work, work, work. Break time. We had two 20-minute paid breaks and one hour unpaid lunch. I'm the only person to go on my break. Lunch time. Everyone was eating at their desks while I go to meet my friends for lunch. On the second break, I once again leave my workplace and go for a short stroll around. Back to work. About a quarter to 6 p.m., I get a call from one of the senior managers in the U.S. She needs the report amended. There were four of us on that call. I'm doing the amendments as we speak and closely monitoring the time. I see it's two minutes to 6 p.m., one minute, 6 p.m. SM2 asterisk rambling about the report. Me, apologies, but I have to stop you right here. SM2, yes, me. It's 6 p.m. here. My day is over. SM2. Huh? Me. As per my management, my working hours are 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., so I must leave now. Have a great weekend and we'll catch up on Monday. I logged off, got my coat, wished everyone a great weekend, and left. It was 6.04 p.m. Both my manager and my senior manager were dumbfounded by what has happened. Looking pale and stare at me in disbelief. It was a glorious sight. I wanted to apologize to my senior manager that I wasn't able to leave at 6 p.m. on the dot, but I thought that would have been way too passive-aggressive, so I just left. I relaxed the rule a bit after a few months, yet I never did more than 30 minutes of overtime. Ironically, once my stakeholders understood that I will not be available for 10-plus hours, they started collaborating earlier in the month. I would have most of my reports done and submitted by the last day of the month. Story 6. You say that you order is less than a kilo? Let's weigh it. A bit of background. I own and operate a BPQ and grill restaurant. We run a special promotion for the euro. We have a promotion for 1 kg of skewers, pork or chicken, for 6.50 euro. This happened on Saturday night. A group came to watch the match between Belgium and Portugal. One of them is a guy known to almost of the restaurant owners in town. Let's call him Dick. Dick has a tendency to complain about the food in order to get freebies either something extra or the whole order. They place their orders, and about 20 minutes later, they're served. 
A few minutes later, my head server Mary comes inside. Sit-downs are only permitted on the patio due to the pandemic. Furious. Mary. Give me the scales! Me. Slightly confused. I was sweating over the grill since we had a lot of orders. What for? Mary. Just give me the fucking scales! I give her the electronic scales, she grabs an empty plate and heads outside. I follow her because I know that something is up. She goes to the group that includes Dick, puts the scales on the table and proclaims, Let's weigh them! You see, Dick had ordered the promotion and then said that his order was missing almost half of it and demanded four more skewers to make it correct. His words. Now in almost any other place, he would be probably right. Most of them buy their skewers already made and they weigh between 100 to 120 grams, which means that a kilo is usually 10 skewers. But we prepare our skewers in-house and are much bigger, between 180 to 220 grams, which is written on the menu. So our kilo is usually six of them. So basically Dick was demanding almost another kilo of meat for free. Dick, smugly, yeah, let's weigh them and then you can bring what you still owe me. Mary grabs the skewers and a fork and starts removing pieces of meat and placing them on the scales. Initially, Dick has a very smug smile. But he starts to frown when three skewers are emptied and the scales shows more than half a kilo of meat. Finally, with the second piece from the fifth skewer, the scales shows just above a kilo. Mary, holding the remained skewers, and smiling smugly. It seems you were right about the order not being correct. We put more. I'll take those, waving the skewers in her hand, back to the kitchen. Enjoy your food. Mary returned, smiling to the kitchen and put the skewers aside while Dick ate his kilo of meat sullenly and the rest of his group smirking. Story 7. Boss agrees with secretary that I am not the office manager, so I stop managing the office. When I was doing my articles at a small law firm, internship to be admitted as an attorney, I was the go-to person for everything at the office. Setting up computers, buying stationery, paying bills, going to court, seeing clients, etc. After being admitted as an attorney, I continued doing all this because the secretary only did about 20% of what a secretary would usually do, and refuse to do anything else. My boss does some shady business, don't pay taxes, etc. So he couldn't just fire her for fear of her ratting him out. He also never disciplined her. We are not in the US. Since we worked from my boss's mother's house, the secretary also spent about 50% of her day just chatting to his mother and they became fast friends. Guess who was always the evil one that everyone ganged up on? Yours truly. I was made out to be incompetent at my job, and I used to cry a lot and almost became an alcoholic from work stress. One day the secretary got really upset with me after I asked her to buy stationery since we didn't even have staples, and after a heated argument told me that I'm not the office manager and should stop lording it about it as if I was, bear in mind I was her senior both as an attorney and in number of years worked at the firm. My boss did nothing and rather got upset with me, and so did his mother. I decided, there and then, I am done doing both secretary work and my attorney work because I was working roughly 50, 60 hours per week, standard is 40, trying to get everything done without receiving overpay. The unemployment rate in my country is around 30%, and in the legal field, supply of lawyers exceeds demand. She knew this, and my boss knew this, but no one cared that I was basically working myself into an early grave. Cue malicious compliance. If everyone agrees that I am not the office manager, then I will stop managing the flow of the office and only do my attorney work. I stopped paying the bills, buying the stationery, reminding my boss of important meetings, etc. Within two weeks, the electricity was cut off for ten days because it wasn't paid, and my boss's elderly mother and the rest of his family had no electricity. We could also not work for those ten days. Once the electricity went on, the phone lines were cut because of non-payment, we could again not work. The post piled up, there were no stationery. We couldn't do service of court documents because our service providers cut us off. It went on for weeks. I simply worked around the issues and sorted my life out. One example. When the Wi-Fi was off, I used my cell phone to hotspot my laptop without telling anyone. In the end, my boss and his mother begged me to do what I used to do, but I refused. Since I was focusing more on my actual work, my fees increased and my pay increased as well. Shortly thereafter, I moved away from that office to our secondary office and worked alongside lovely colleagues who all did what they got paid to do. I have been at this new office, same firm, just a different location, for the last two years. 